few things inspire us like space. It can be easy to forget what's over us as we go about our daily lives, but then every night the, the curtains are lifted and we see this vast, unlimited space. Galaxies, stars, planets, moons, asteroids, space dust. Unlimited opportunity to further ourselves and our understanding and our capabilities. The notion of being able to leave the surface of our planet is, is a relatively new one. Um, many of our, our great-grandparents were born into an age where powered flight had not yet occurred. And I have to wonder, when the Wright brothers first took flight, could they have imagined that, that flight would transform our lives so quickly, or would it, would it have gone down as a footnote in the history books? Well, in 70 short years, the jet age was upon us, and the, the spruce and fabric of the Wright Flyer had given way to advanced airspace alloys, and the chain and sprocket propellers had given way to turbine jet engines. And suddenly, global transportation on a, on a time scale that had never been possible before became a reality. Something else happened that year. As you all know, we, we walked on the moon. Well, he walked on the moon. Um, but the significance of that was, was clear to everyone watching at home on Earth. And we had built the biggest rocket ever, and, and it worked, which is amazing. And with this, with this success behind us, what would happen next as, as the rocket continued to evolve? What could we do? We could go to Mars and build a colony there. We could put solar panels in outer space where there's never clouds and there's, there's never night. And we could beam sustainable energy from space to Earth 24 hours a day. We could build the biggest telescope ever, bigger than any telescope ever built or, or even proposed to be built on Earth in outer space where there's no gravity and no atmosphere. And we could, we'd be able to not only detect the presence of, of exoplanets, planets of other suns, but actually see what they look like. We could do all this and more as the rocket evolved. And indeed, since then, we've, we have done amazing things. We have put telescopes in space. We have space stations. And all of these achievements are amazing. And we've gotten better at making rockets. Uh, for example, S SpaceX is now leading the way and changing the, what we think about the, the cost and performance of rockets. But the rocket itself has not fundamentally changed. Uh, like the, the rockets of the Apollo program, the rockets we use today are powered by chemical combustion, um, using chemical propellants. And despite years of, of work, the cost of space launch has remained tremendously expensive, too expensive for all but a handful of the opportunities that are available in space. So, why has, have chemical rockets remained so expensive? Well, for one reason, they push our abilities to engineer and produce materials to the limits. As an example, the space shuttle main tank holds 800 tons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, a tremendously dangerous combination. And it holds this uh, over several gravity acceleration all the way from the surface of the Earth to space. And yet, as a, as a mass fraction of the, of the contents, the space shuttle tank weighs less than an aluminum soda can. If cars were made uh, with this level of materials and engineering, a full-size pickup truck would weigh less than 100 pounds. Another challenge is that chemical rockets, due to their efficiency limitations, require multiple stages and are generally non-reusable. Uh, imagine if just to get to work every day you had to ditch your car two or three times and go buy another one. And that's why it's so exciting to see SpaceX making progress in this area of reusable rockets, uh, literally as we speak. But another fundamental challenge 
uh, is that throughout the history of spaceflight, it's been risky. Chemical propellants are incredibly energetic, very dangerous, and unfortunately, over-engineering isn't an option. You can't afford the weight that it takes to make a component any stronger than it absolutely needs to be. And walking this fine line, sometimes mistakes are made. Could, could the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster have been prevented if there were three O-rings instead of only two? So to understand a little bit about why chemical rockets are limited in their performance and how we can get around this, we'll take a very brief course in rocket science. And I'm not a rocket scientist, and I apologize to any actual rocket scientists for this, <laughs> for this demonstration. But for the rest of us, rockets work on a principle that we're all very familiar with. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The action is, is a, a propellant being uh, expelled by the nozzle of the rocket, and the reaction is the acceleration of the rocket. So it's tempting to think that to improve the efficiency of a rocket and make it better, we'll make it expel more propellant so that it goes faster. But it turns out that when we do this, we have to build a bigger rocket because we have to hold more propellant. And the increased force that we gain by expelling more propellant is, is offset by the fact that we have a heavier, slower vehicle and a larger rocket that we need to accelerate. So the real way to improve the efficiency of a rocket is to increase the speed with which the propellant comes out of the rocket. This effective exhaust velocity is the key metric. And Rocket scientists call this, this number uh, the specific impulse, or ISP, and it's like, it's the MPG of rockets. Not exactly, but for, our, for the purpose of our discussion. So if, if a rocket had a window sticker like a car, which I'm pretty sure they don't, um, it would look like this. Uh, and this would correspond to the space shuttle engine, which is regarded as, as one of the most efficient engines made. Um, its specific impulse is 450 seconds. And why, why can't it be higher? Well, this engine works by combusting hydrogen and oxygen. Um, these are chemical bonds that are, uh, have certain energies. And if you do the math, I, I didn't, but someone else did. Um, the fundamental theoretical maximum energy available to these propellants uh, would give you a, a theoretical ISP of 500 seconds. So the fact that the space shuttle engine can get 450 is actually pretty good. It did, it did pretty good. But how do we get it higher, and, and why does it matter? The ISP determines how much you can actually carry with you to space. So let's assume that we have a rocket, uh, and no matter how much it weighs, 5% of its mass will be the structure, the, the, the mechanical support that, that holds the rocket together. That gives us 95% of the mass to be either payload or propellant. Obviously, we want to get as much payload to space as we can. And what we see is if the specific impulse is below around 300 seconds in this example, then the, we can't carry any payload to space. In fact, we can't, the rocket's not going to space at all. Now, with, with the range of a specific impulse achievable with chemical engines uh, around 400 and slightly above, we see that it's possible to carry a few percent payload to space. Um, and and that's, that's why getting to space is so difficult today. It's only barely possible. We can't afford to make the rocket any heavier. Um, it barely works at all. But if we could improve the specific impulse to a, a modest number, let's say it can be doubled to 800 seconds, we see that the payload increases dramatically, in this case by, by 10 times. And that's why it's so interesting and so exciting to work on a fundamentally new technology for space launch. Now, as I said, the, the best known propellants, the, which are generally regarded as hydrogen and oxygen, are limited in their specific impulse available. So even at 3,600 degrees, the incredibly hot exhaust that comes out of, out of a hydrogen and oxygen engine, these mostly steam molecules uh, are not moving fast enough. So what we can do is instead of trying to get the, the exhaust to be hotter, we can use a lighter weight exhaust molecule. Hydrogen is a very light molecule, and if we can heat it to only 1800 degrees, it will be moving so fast that it will correspond to a specific impulse of uh, 800 to 1000 seconds, uh, twice as good 
the steam, even though it's at a much cooler temperature. And, and these are temperatures that are compatible with known materials. So the technology that can be used to, to heat this propellant, hydrogen, is something that we actually use every day in our kitchen to heat our food, microwave energy. By beaming microwave energy from the ground to the vehicle to heat the hydrogen, we can efficiently propel a rocket to space. Now, this idea was, was actually conceived uh, over 100 years ago uh, by one of the grandfathers of rocketry. But more recently in the 2000s, work at, at Caltech, NASA, and JPL was done to show that, that this would become feasible using today's technologies. And uh, most recently, a startup company was founded uh, by students at, at Caltech, uh, Dmitry Talakovich and Sean McGuire, and uh, with support of Richard Shaden, um, founded Escape Dynamics, which is the company that I work at. Um, and we have the support of, of Caltech, uh, Autodesk, and Singularity University. And we're putting together a team to bring this concept to a reality um, using today's technology. So what's remarkable about this idea is that the rocket can be much simpler than a chemical combustion rocket engine. Um, what we need is a tank to hold the hydrogen and <coughs> Below that is a heat exchanger. This is what absorbs the microwave energy um, as the hydrogen flows through this and heats it up to the temperatures needed so that when it passes through the nozzle, it, it will be converted efficiently to thrust. Now, of course, a, an actual vehicle will be uh, much more complex than this, but the fundamental components, you can tell, are already much simpler. So to make this a reality, we're working to, to utilize existing technologies and demonstrate them and integrate them at a scale that hasn't been achieved yet. So we're working on making high power, uh, 100 kilowatt uh, microwave sources called gyrotrons, and we'll be scaling these up to megawatt output capacity to provide the ground-based power needed for this propulsion system. We're developing advanced high temperature materials for the heat exchanger that will be required both to withstand the the great stresses of, of the high gas pressures um, and aerodynamic loading while still also tolerating the high temperatures that will be involved with this. And we're working on advanced beaming and tracking systems on the ground uh, to enable safe, reliable delivery of microwave energy to a flying vehicle. Uh, we've been working for, for over two years now on, this, on the safety systems for these to make sure that we can make it safe for people and, yes, even for birds um, to be prevented from exposure to this through safety interlocks. Now, there's another very exciting application of this technology, and it's something that we'll be able to demonstrate uh, much sooner than we'll be able to demonstrate space launch. And that is, we will be able to use this ground-based infrastructure to deliver wireless electrical power to UAVs, to aircraft uh, flying through Earth's atmosphere. And the enabling technology for this is the rectenna, which is a combination of, uh, for rectifying antenna, something that was invented over 50 years ago by William Brown at Raytheon. And working with, uh, with a team at NASA and JPL, he was able to demonstrate uh, that microwave power can be beamed very efficiently over great distances, o over miles. Um, and now we are ready to put this technology to work. So by coupling this technology with modern UAVs, um, which are evolving every day for an increasing number of applications, uh, we're going to be able to put together UAV systems that can fly and recharge in the air without ever needing to land. So it's not going to be easy to to bring this vision to reality, but we think it's, it's gonna be fun and it's going to be worth it. So I want within my lifetime to see us go farther than the moon. I wanna see us go to Mars and uh, build a, the biggest telescope yet. Uh, let's go mine asteroids um, or leave our solar system. Um, it's going to be exciting 
and it's going to start with finding a better way to go to space. Thank you.